Let me share your screen. This is resolution, so <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding, right? This is advanced stuff. Actually, it worked pretty well last time. I didn't check the video afterwards, but did anybody watch the video from last? Anybody? How did it turn out? Good? Awesome. Because that's the first time that I've done a hangout where other people are controlling the, the screen. Is we're sure hey, it works. look. I got it <laughs> figured out. Right. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. Thanks. Um, all right. So this is YYCJS, and I'm Eric, and this is David. And, you know, we, I guess now we're a little over three years running this. So you can check all of our uh, stuff up is up online. It's up on GitHub. Um, you can find stuff through the website, although it's getting kind of outdated, yycjs.com. And then uh, up on YouTube, we have a bunch of the previous lectures up there. So if you've missed a session, um, you can find all the code, all the slides, all the videos and stuff are up all on those resources. So today, we've got, um, we've got Ray, who's talking about Accelerator stuff and building uh, mobile apps in JavaScript, uh, but native mobile apps. And then we've got Chung, who's going to talk about it, kind of give us an intro to Ember. And so you guys are all here. Any of the latecomers, feel free to grab a beer, grab a drink at the back. Um, we're going to do 30 minutes for the first session and 30 minutes for the second. Uh, take a break in between. Um, so our sponsors here are your app assembly. This is the co-working space. If you're looking for a desk, feel free to uh, to hit them up. It's a great space to work from here and downstairs. And I think they're actually expanding to the second floor as well. Um, we got beers provided by Village, Village Brewery um, and Petrofeet, so give them a shout out. We also work with Startup Calgary to, to help coordinate and put a bunch of these events on, as well as events outside of uh, YYCJS. So every Tuesday there's a hack night going on that uh, features a different kind of technology stack. Um, and I guess, who else? So today we actually have food around 7 o'clock provided by App Venue. So do you want to give a quick uh, quick little spiel about what App Venue is? Sure. I'm James. I'm from App Venue. Here you were. Can you the mic? Oh, I'm not loud. No, so the internet. Oh, no, internet. <laughs> I, I have an internet account. Um, I'm from App Venue. Uh, we, do, we help manage merchandise for live events. And uh, we operate out of this building as well, which is a fantastic place to work in. We're a small startup. I have six developers here. And uh, the other two founders are down in California. So it's a lot of fun and a crazy space to be in. I don't know any musicians, but they're all insane. And we work with them. So um, give a shout out to some of the other guys. Oh, we have people on our platform like Michael Buble, uh, Weird Al Yankovic. You're on Mars. Uh, you're in the country. Blake Shelton, Luke Bryan, uh, people like that. All sorts of little bands as well. Um, just every genre, pretty much. So, anyway, I, I'm also looking for people. So if anybody's interested, I left a stack of cards back there. But beside the beer, even though I'm not providing the beer, but uh, <laughs> I am providing some pizza. Okay, so I think that's it. So without further ado, let's bring up uh, Ray and get the party started. Wired up and stuff? Should be. Hope so. 
All right, that's looking good. And you can go ahead. Okay. Oh, he did. I did. That's why you're seeing me. Okay, cool. Okay, so I, we're okay? Yep. All right. Go ahead. Now I'm just going to go ahead. All right. So uh, just to start, my name is uh, Ray Belisle. I'm a app dev who's been working oh, as a developer, as a executive, as a bunch of things for probably longer than some people here have been alive. But uh, about four or five years ago, I started looking at really more at the time um, as a uh, out of interest, just to uh, just to learn about what what it could do. Um, I'd gone. I started off as an app developer. Um, you know, moved into PHP and LAMP stacks and that kind of thing when uh, we were doing a lot of internet things uh, in the mid '90s, and eventually uh, got to a point where I just had an interest in learning about. Um, in learning about mobile development and what it could do, and uh, started playing with it. So the first, you know, the first apps I started playing with were uh, um, were Android apps, and then I decided to move into iOS development. And quickly, I decided that I wasn't smart enough to do this. What I mean by that is, you know, when you start taking a look at mobile development, you really do have uh, even then multiple platforms. You know, iOS was very strong, but people were talking about HTML5, uh, you know, web apps, and then Android came along, and it's SDK, and iOS is SDK, and CSS, and this, and that, and I was kind of doing it for fun. I mean, <laughs> you know, I like to learn things, and I like to do things, but it, it became really difficult to go ahead and stay on top of everything that was happening with every platform, and really feel like you were proficient, and, and getting somewhere, because every time you sort of found something, you develop something in for Android, and then you develop something for iOS natively, and then something would break, and then you have to go find it in one and figure out did it break it in the other one, or you know, was I smarter than that the second time I did it? Things like that. And I had a background in JavaScript and came across a, a company out of the US called Accelerator. So Accelerator has been around for about six years now, and they started off as a JavaScript to iOS um, Compilation, and that's really what they do today. You go ahead and you build all of your code in JavaScript, then you compile it, and it compiles using the native stack for the platform. So, in for iOS, it uses Xcode to compile with, and it uses Java to compile for Android, and then it creates a native application that you can run on one platform or the other. So, for me, you know that seemed to be a good choice. And what's happened over the last five years is I've gone from being uh, sort of a, a bit of a, for interest sake, to really making my living doing this. I develop mobile apps. I develop mobile apps for people using JavaScript as the base language. And as a JavaScript group, I wanted to share the kinds of things that I've been able to do and learn about Accelerator and kind of expose you guys to that and answer any questions you might have on that. So one of the things about native development is people always ask, so what, you know, what are the pros and cons of doing native versus um, other other ways of doing things. I mean, certainly a familiar user interface, you're trying to go ahead and use all of the components of, of native. Performance is great. Access to all of the device capabilities, those are all really good things from a native standpoint. And they're also, you know, all of these same things are available from Accelerator. Uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight is when you're moving from JavaScript, if you've done a lot of JavaScript web coding, one of the things that can drive developers nuts is the speed of development. So when you go ahead and build something, again, you're compiling it through the, you know, through the tool set that's been provided to you. So you have a code compile and run cycle, which takes time. You change a line of code, it goes ahead, and you have to, you know, go through the compile and run cycle on, you know, on a uh, on a native application. So web development is fast. Web development is easy. We go ahead, we change the JavaScript, we hit refresh, we see the results. We change the CSS, we hit refresh, we see the results. There's, you know, you can go ahead and, and move things along very quickly. You don't get that same kind of instantaneous feedback when you're working with, um, when you're working with native uh, development tools. 
But what I wanted to showcase a little bit today is how you can do that, make that transition a little bit using your JavaScript skills and get uh, very quick sort of feedback from a native stack. So what I'm going to use today is Accelerator, which is it's not a language, it's a JavaScript SDK. So you basically you code in JavaScript and you access everything through a JavaScript SDK. It creates a native app. So just uh, a lot of people have looked at, I mean, if you're familiar with, um, you know, Aptana and some of the work that they do, it basically takes your HTML5 application and wraps it into a wrapper that runs it on the native device. But it isn't a native application. And so the, the best example I have is, is this for people. When I was developing in Accelerator and they went from iOS 6 to iOS 7, Apple did, they went ahead and changed a whole bunch of UI things. Everything from how things were laid out to, you know, a really good example is a button. It used to be that buttons in iOS 6 had a rounded corner and it looked like a button and they switched to iOS 7 and now you had a blue label. That was it. That's your interface. So if you were developing an HTML5 hosted mobile web page, you would have to go into the CSS and modify the CSS to look like the new iOS 7 button. So you'd have to go in there and change it. What the, basically the way Accelerator works is when you say, I want to create a button in Accelerator, it will go ahead and call the native um, device and say, create a button for me. If you're running on iOS 6, it creates one with a the, with the border around it. If you're running on iOS 7, it creates one just with the label. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to do anything. You basically just recompile for iOS 7, and it'll update your UI for you. That's a good example of some of the ways that uh, it goes ahead and, and, and works for you and uses the native components that you're running on. The other nice thing about Accelerator is that it's free and it's open source. So you can go to the website, you can download it, you can use it. I've published apps. I've published many apps, and basically, you don't have to pay them a dime. You can just use their tools as they are today. So it's kind of nice that way. They also have a whole stack of tools. So they have some of the things I'm going to show today are really around the mobile devices and that, but they actually have a whole Node.js farm that you can use for your applications. So go ahead and upload Node.js and host your Node.js apps on there. That'll connect to your uh, mobile applications. They also have their own... Um, web MongoDB app that has its own RESTful interface. So you can go ahead and create uh, MongoDB, uh, have access to a MongoDB database right from their whole platform. And it makes it, and they've got hooks right into it. So it makes it nice and easy to go ahead and connect to it. Titanium has over 640,000 developers and over 260 million devices running Titanium applications. So it's not, you know, they are well known as you know, a good platform, a good application. So if you get into it, they're not going to disappear tomorrow if you, you know, if you spend some time figuring it out. So what I wanted to do today is everybody here is probably really used to developing native applications, web applications using JavaScript. But now I'm going to show you how you can do that on, or sorry, on a web page. And I'm going to show you how you can do it for a device at the speed of web. So one of the things I'm going to be using in conjunction with Titanium today is called TI Shadow. And basically what it does is you can load up a, uh, you can create an application that you put on your device, and what it does is as you change your um, source code, it basically sends over a delta of the source code to the mobile device. So it's very quick to get the results you want because you don't have to wait for that whole compile, you know, change code, compile, and run sequence. You basically go ahead and change a line of code. That's the only piece of code that goes over to the device. So it's nice and easy and fast. And it really goes ahead and shows the power of what you can do um, with Titanium. So if you want to play along, and I've got a couple of devices here, anybody who has a Android app on the local Wi-Fi network here, so the Assembly Guest Network, if you've got an Android device and you want to play along here, I do have a, um, the TI Shadow application that you can download from uh, that uh, Dropbox address. And then I do have the IP address of my device here. Give me one second here. So if you're interested in following along, you can go ahead and load up that TI Shadow app. And then when it goes ahead and asks you what server to connect to, we'll just go ahead and grab the IP address here. And also, you probably want to be up on uh, 
guest. You have to be on assembly guest. Yeah, you got to be connected to assembly guest. And uh, we do have. Uh, I have the IP address here that we can go ahead and if anybody's interested, we'll uh, I'll fire it up on the screen again. So, if you when you're working with uh, with Titanium, if you think about the way that if you think as a web developer, I've got a to-do app that I'm going to go ahead and show. So thinking as a web developer, we really have on the mobile device a page. Then we've got a div that shows, you know, uh, we've got a label on the left-hand side, and we have a graphic on the right-hand side. We have a list underneath. And so if you think about when you're laying things out, it's very similar in titanium terms. You basically have a window, and then we've got a view, and inside the view we've got a couple of other views and inside those views, we've got one's a label, one's a, um, an image. So it, if you're trying to sort of relate what you do on the website with what you're going to see here, that gives you a pretty good idea. So we'll go ahead and build. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I've got two devices, and I'm just going to have them up to a couple of tables here. So what's going to happen is I've got an iPad here, and I've got an uh, Android tablet. And so while I'm going ahead and doing things at the front here, you're going to see it reflected on those devices, as well as I've got a simulator here that uh, we'll be taking a look at. So Titanium is a, it's, we have basically the SDK and a, um, and a UI allowing us to go ahead and code as we go along. And when we go ahead and are, uh, want to save this, we can go ahead and see what we're changing immediately on the device itself. So this is the Titanium Studio, studio which is actually um, Aptana. I don't know if anybody ever used Aptana Studio as a, um, as a editor, but uh, Titanium bought them a couple of years ago. Um, and Aptana Studio lets us go ahead and build um, and code the application itself. So really, let's just go through a couple of things here. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask. So basically, Titanium has, it uses an MVC layout. So model view controller is what we're looking at in this, uh, in this environment. So right here, the main, uh, the main file that gets loaded on launch is called index. So we have three, three uh, different files that make up the uh, index themselves. One is the, one is the view. So basically when we were talking about windows and views and those kinds of things, we basically create a view by going ahead and defining what's going to be in the view itself. So here we have a window with an ID and a title. And we could go ahead and call this to do JS. We've got a header. We've got a table view, which is what we're seeing over here. And then we really have two pieces. And so when you're talking about cross-platform applications, we can go ahead and define what goes into a view based on providing a tag in the XML. So if you take a look at the two tags here, we've got a uh, view that is going to be shown if you're on iOS, and we're going to have a menu that gets shown if you're using Android. So we go ahead and define both pieces, and the compiler will go ahead and strip out that don't apply to the platform you're using, so you don't end up with extra code in the in your uh, deployment. You basically just end up with what you need in the application itself. So if I go ahead and say, we'll go ahead quickly here and just change the label here. And save it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and send the updates. to the device itself. So what will happen here is it'll go ahead and compile the uh, code and send it out as a bundle to those devices. And no. <laughs> of course. It changed on those. I think uh, I didn't reconnect to the right uh, 
I'm not connected to the right IP address because I did this at home. So since we're playing along here, let's go back to, we just grab the right IP address here. That's what it is. So I'm going to connect up to my local server here. 172.16.80.73. And we're not connected. Come on. Mm. One seven two dot sixteen dot eighty dot seventy three. This would be like way better if you could see it on the screen. One seventy two dot sixteen dot eighty dot seventy three. Yeah, you know what? Well, I'm going to restart the simulator here and just see if it uh, do that quick. There we go. Connected. All right. We'll get back here. And we'll go ahead and save that. And then we'll send the update. And so there we go. To do that, yes. So here we can go ahead and see the changes that we're making almost real time as we're making them within the app, app itself. So if we go ahead and take a look at, you know, as we're laying things out, wanting to do things like you know, something as simple as changing the font and have it reflected, or changing the title and have it reflected. We can go ahead and see it here. And basically, once we've got the so once we've got the layout itself, and the layout shows you know the correct layout for Android, the correct the correct layout for iOS, we can take a look at the code itself, and we're basically just using regular JavaScript code. So a collection. So uh, Titanium uses Backbone. So if anybody's familiar with Backbone for models and collections, it uses the same Backbone JS that. Uh, that you've got out there, so we've got collections, we've got models. We can go ahead and attach those models, take a look at, um, we've got different, um, different model types that are available. So this one's storing it as local storage. But you could use MySQL, you could use a remote server to store information. Um, and then we've got things where the, if we take a look at that index file here, we have a to-do table that has a, a where function for a data filter and a transform function that are both defined in our uh, index.js file. So we can take a look at the where function, and what it'll do is it'll take a look at the collection model and only return the models that match what we've got up here that are indexes, all active and done. So as we go ahead and work with this, we can say, well, show me only the active to-dos, show me the done to-dos, and it'll go ahead and filter those automatically here through 
the where function, and again through the transform function. So we've got a transform item, and all it's really doing is adding some brackets around the data value that's returned, but you could do anything you'd like here. You can go ahead and manipulate the data that's there. If we go ahead and add a to-do item, so when we go ahead and click on that add to-do item button, it'll go ahead and pull up another screen where we can add the information. That item gets added to the to-do item list. So again, we've got the way that uh, this works is it's creating a controller. And again, a controller is the combination of the view, the style, and the code called add. So if we take a look at the add XML file, it's pretty simple. It's really just a field with a hint text. We've got two buttons, one to add item and one to close item. And so we can take a look at this, check out the code associated with it. If we add an item, we're creating a new model and putting the value in there. If we're, and then we save it. If we go ahead and want to close the window, all it does is it takes the uh, the window itself, the window ID, and closes it. So if you really take a look at this particular application, we've got a full-fledged you know, to-do app that is saving data locally on the device in probably less than 150 lines of code. And this, and all the code is written in JavaScript. Everything is written in JavaScript. All your controller code is written in JavaScript. So once you go ahead and learn a little bit more about the uh, SDK itself, how you access things like, you know, the camera on the device if you want, or um, other objects on the device, you can go ahead and attach to them and use them, and it creates native, you know, this is a native uh, label, this is a native image, this is a native uh, text, uh, text list, and you can go ahead and Go crazy. So it, just as an introduction, wanted to give people a flavor for what you can do with it and how it works. Uh, Questions? Yeah. How, how do you access um, options? Uh, I've got a lot of, like, mobile development and, um, you know, things like forcing the keyboard off or forcing the keyboard down. It's always a pain in the ass. And I start to, like, measuring, like, how many states are left in the keyboard and down. Yeah. Like, it'd be nice if you could just say, like, hey, iOS, tell me how it's So the question is, um, how do you go ahead and access device-specific functions through the API to do things uh, to get information about the device itself that might be different between an iOS device and an Android device, for example? So if you take a look, for example, at the, I mean, probably the best place to spend time at is really taking a look at the documentation that's there. But uh, you know, to give you an example of some of the, when you take a look at a, let's see, let's go to a UI object and let's go to a text field because that was one of the things you were, you know, you were talking about a little bit there. Um, a text field is an object that is available regardless of uh, whether you're using it on a BlackBerry or iOS or mobile web or Android or Tizen. <laughs> so all of these, uh, a text field is only certain properties that are available for certain platforms. So for example, um, if you take a look at, um, I think Clear on Edit, no, no, Clear on Edit. I'm trying to remember which one is the, uh, the Clear Mode button. Yeah, so if you want the X in the corner of a text field, so you've got that uh, button. You can go ahead and click on the X, and it gets rid of everything. That's an iOS-only specific property. So when you set that property, it only will apply to iOS. All the other platforms will ignore it. So you're always using the same base uh, object, but you have access to only certain, um, certain properties or methods that apply to that particular object. Um, you know, a, another... and by moving rows around, all that is supported on iOS, but those properties and those methods only fire for an iOS application versus an Android application. So uh, you sort of use that base control, and from there you can go ahead and enable or disable functionality.
Any other questions at the back? Um, no, you don't have to use their framework. You can use other frameworks. So um, it's, I mean, it's nice because they've done a pretty good job of tightly, you know, coupling things together so it makes it easy, but you could use a different framework if you want to. But realize that it isn't a, it isn't a web framework. So if you're thinking about JavaScript and web frameworks, it's not the same thing as a mobile framework. So there are some other ones that other people have put out there in the Titanium um, community because it is an open source. You can find other ones, but you know it, it won't work necessarily with just a standard you know web framework, for example. Like, could you could you not use Backbone? Could you use something? Well, else? yeah, you could use something else. You could you could plug something else in instead of Backbone if you wanted to. Absolutely, absolutely. At the back. It does. Well, basically, it creates an HTML5 application. Well, it, it'll go ahead and wrap. Um, it'll create, you know, uh, it'll create uh, CSS objects and HTML5 objects like text fields, like um, date pickers, and those kinds of things. But it does it for a mobile web page instead of for the device itself. So it'll go ahead when you when you create a, a project, you can go ahead and define what your target. Um, you know what, what targets you're trying to hit, and then as you go ahead and build, you, I mean, the, the biggest thing is really to be aware of the differences in visual differences, especially when you get into an MVC framework. All of the, all the logic code you can keep, it really becomes, you know, do we need to do something special with the, you know, this text field to see the X in it? I've built an Android text field that has a X in it because Titanium doesn't provide one, for example. So I can call either one, and it'll display that way. No, basically, it, it, the question is, is, is it all server-side? For a HTML5, it's basically it's local. You, you basically end up putting it on the device, so the, the JavaScript is running in the context of the device. Any other questions? Hey, one. Um, how does it kind of compare to, or have you, have you looked into um, OpenGAP, or I guess like Cordova now? How does it compare to that? So uh, the big difference between Cordova and Titanium and Xamarin, as far as the, the things that I know about them, the big difference between Cordova and Titanium is Cordova basically creates an HTML5 application. So everything is running in the context of a web view, you know, for, uh, or, and it gets wrapped into a wrapper that lets you distribute it as a um, as a, an application, but it's really running in a, in the context of a web view. And so, again, if you wanted to change something visually, you'd change the CSS of the web view, and that would update it. But um, in the example I gave about the button, so you'd have to create a button CSS and insert it into your application and republish it. And what it's creating is it's creating an HTML5 button on the screen and presenting it. What Titanium is doing is it's actually creating a native iOS button and presenting it to you. So that's really the that's really the big difference. I think Xamarin compiles like similar to Accelerator. Xamarin does. The big difference between Xamarin and Accelerator is uh, Xamarin you actually have to go ahead and uh, the core code it can be used across platform, but you actually have to go ahead and build different UI code across all of the different platforms. So you end up having to create multiple you maintain multiple UI specs across the different platforms. Yeah? So uh, I heard this thing called Ionic Framework, and I understand it's similar to Cordova. Have you worked with it at all? Or you know? No, I'm sorry, I have not. Ionic Framework, is that what you... Yeah, I use AngularJS. Okay. Uh, as a front end? Yeah, okay. it apparently does hybrid, hybrid apps as well. So. Right. So, yeah, no, I can't compare it. I haven't looked at it at all. I love Angular, though. But <laughs> at the back, yeah. Um, so the question was, if you're uh, writing code for two different platforms, versions of the platform, for example, iOS six and iOS seven, how can you do that? So in, uh, in 
titanium, you can actually go ahead and determine, you can query the device and say, what, what, are you, what am I running on? What version of, the, of iOS am I running on? And if you need to take certain, you know, if you need to do certain things because it's one versus the other, you can do that. I mean, for example, if you wanted to uh, load up uh, the fingerprint recognition, well, that only works on iOS 7 and higher. So, you know, the, so if you want to do the fingerprint swipe on iOS. So you can do things like that where you might not load the module or tell the user that they can't use it if they're trying to, you know, record their fingerprint as authentication. Is there any more, uh, like, sorry. Go ahead. We're trying to get to <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, as I, I didn't have dinner, I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Last question. Okay, last question. Last question. Like, um, different UI stuff, so you know how um, older versions of iOS had, like, spring and struts, um, and now they've got auto layout. Like, does it sort of handle that transparently for you? It basically handles it transpar transparently for you, yes. Cool. So it's nice that way. Um, I know that everybody wants to get to uh, dinner and is starving, so I appreciate your time. I'm here for the rest of the night and happy to answer any questions, so uh, come and seek me out. Awesome. Thank you. I hate breaking up the pizza party. Hi. That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, this is a. I'll mention that right away, actually. All right. Um, this is Sean. Sean is probably going to tell a little bit about himself. And he's going to talk about an intro to Ember JS. And I'm going to let you go ahead right away. Awesome. All right. So, um, How's the night going, everyone? Good? Yeah, pizza's good? Yeah, well, that's awesome. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you guys about Ember.js. So my title is talk, my talk is titled Eight Lessons in Ember. So I'm going to talk about eight things that I think I wish I had learned when I started learning Ember.js. Also give you an introduction to Ember.js. So um, before I get started, everyone, uh, you can view this talk on your browser right now. If you go to this URL, I'm going to spell it to you verbatim. It's s-r-e-o-r-e-s uh, dot github dot com slash lessons dash in dash ember. Okay? So you can view this these slides in the same time. So um, this is what I'll go over for this talk. So first we'll talk about what is Ember.js. I'll explain to you some of the different alternatives and libraries that it may be compared to. So take a look at that. Then we'll take a look at when to use Ember.js. I think this is a really important point. Uh, we'll talk about when you should and shouldn't use Ember.js. I kind of wish I'd known that when I started using it because it's good at some things and it's not good at other things. We'll take a look at the architecture of the application and how it's structured. So that includes models, routes, controllers, and components. And we'll talk about how components are actually replacing views. So. Then I'll talk about the eight lessons I learned. I'm not going to go into detail what those are. You'll see. And finally, I'll take any questions you guys have. So hold your questions until the end if you can. So uh, just a little about me here. That's me. You can find me on Twitter, on GitHub. As well, you can fi find me on my website. So, uh, so you can definitely find information about me. I've been doing web development for about seven, eight years now. I currently work for a company called Axie Mortgage Solutions. So I work remotely, and I make CRM software, which is used to manage contacts and so forth. So um, before I go any further, I just want to do a disclaimer here. So first of all, um, I'm not an Ember expert. I've been using the framework for about six, maybe seven months. And although I feel I'm pretty confident in using the framework, I'm still not 100% on everything. So if I say something that may be wrong, just correct me. Um, I have been using it in my startup for a while, so I think I get the hang of it, but you never know, so um, let me know if I say anything. And Okay, so uh, let's go over the problem. Let's talk about why you might, what you might, what you do in an everyday job. If you're a web developer, you probably know this. So there are a couple problems that come up when you're building large web applications. One of them is divitis. Uh, bootstrap is a big problem for this. Foundation as well, but less. Uh, high-end high -end frameworks. 
will often have this where they'll have divs and divs and divs and divs and then you lose track of what's actually going on in your application. So in my, one of the last talks I did, I talked about semantic structured HTML and how your styles are getting bloated and that kind of leads to classitis. So classitis is similar, you just get classes and classes and classes. And if you're following the whole um, uh, object oriented CSS or OOCSS, uh, which was actually introduced by Nicholas, Nicole Sullivan, she kind of talks about that. But what they actually emphasize is that you don't get class -sided. You don't want to have too many elements in your, in your DOM tree. And that could be a problem. So you have all these elements, and how do you navigate what the classes are, and how many classes do you need to add to a new element if you're creating something? And that's why you might say we have style guides. But I would argue that we could just solve this problem entirely by just being reasonable and not, not having these. And so that's one of the problems that frameworks often try to, try to address. We often have heavy Ajaxified applications now. That, that now that our clients are becoming powerful enough, we have browsers on our mobile devices that are almost as fast as computers two years ago, the really high-end ones. So we're seeing phones with 2.4 gigahertz and the new iPhones, of course. There's a lot of potential. And so we're starting to bring that, that weight to the client. And that, that, in, that, that makes it a little bit more difficult as a web developer because you're making all these AJAX requests and, and it becomes quite unwieldy after a while. You wonder where the, how your API is structured and so forth. So there's a lack of structure then that kind of leads on to this other problem. Not necessarily spaghetti code, but you lose, you, you have a lack of structure. And uh, sometimes another developer might come, they have to learn how your whole framework is structured. So that can be sometimes a problem. Finally, there's an abundance of frameworks. If you're working at a big, big company, then you know how many, how confusing your tech stack can be. I mean, I was watching a talk about PayPal, and their tech stack changed so immensely, and that led them to release a framework called Kraken on Node.js. So there's a lot to do with, with building your own tools that can be beneficial sometimes. And that, that's what I mean when I say uh, uh, an abundance of frameworks. You have jQuery, you've got Dojo before. They have all these other frameworks, and there's so many of them, and they call this um, Yet another framework syndrome, YAFS. <laughs> There's actually a name for it. So, so you're starting a new project, right? So you have lots of options. You could use jQuery. You can use AngularJS. You can use Backbone. You can use ReactJS with Flux. Uh, that's a fairly new addition to ReactJS, but that's because ReactJS is just the view anyway. And you can use CanJS. Talk to Dave about that. <laughs> you can use Knockout. You can use Montage JS, that's a cool new one. They use web components and Polymer and web components. And then there's Ember.js. Not to discredit it for being last, but there is Ember.js, and I imagine you're all interested. So, um, just to show of hands, who here has heard or uh, has heard of or has used Ember.js in the past? Wow, I am impressed. I was not expecting that number. There's so I may I may not have to go through everything and go over the intro, which is good. Um, so this is Ember.js. It was created by Tom Dale and Yehuda Katz. They're the two creators, and there's a number of other people who also influenced it. They're still um, they're still big on it, and so Ember.js is supposed to be an, an app, a framework for ambitious applications. Those are kind of um, meaningless words until you get into the idea of what it means to be ambitious. But uh, but anyway, that's what it is, and that's the that's a little logo. And so, when do you use Ember? So what I think. The best time to use Ember is is in, is in content heavy applications, meaning you're dealing with lots of data, and you've got lots of different examples of that. So one of them is, for example, job boards, forums, time tracking software. If you're doing real time data visualization, Ember JS works really well with WebSockets. Actually, uh, you could look at a library called Orbit JS. They've got some great stuff out there for how to do it. Also, the Ember data adapter is really customizable to do your own WebSockets implementation. Uh, simply listening to an event being emitted by your so your socket server. So if you're doing a CMS, blogs, uh, any really e-commerce stuff, it's pretty good for that. Ember pretty much emphasizes real, um, not only real time, but also having the um, having access to a database and just making REST calls is really easy with Ember data. So, so but don't use Ember if you're doing one of these things. So if you're making a game, don't use Ember. You can look at, uh, I think it's called Pixie Framework or something. There's some great frameworks out there that can support your, your 2D, 3D games, some of them even using WebGL now, which is really exciting. But don't use Ember. If you're making a traditional website, it's probably not the best. I mean, lots of times if you're building a traditional website, when I say that, I mean like if you're just doing static content, what's the point, right? Just have your HTML files, 
and do it the normal way, and then you're just dealing with the data. You don't need a framework just because you're transitioning between pages, right? That's so stupid. And upgrading an existing website, I think that's a really important point. If you do something in Ember, you really don't, you, it's either the Ember way or no way. So Ember is very opinionated, and I'll get to that later. So basically, unless you're starting new, don't use Ember. Don't. <laughs> okay, so Ember is supposed to be MVC, but I kind of think this is a misnomer because even though it's dubbed MVC, I think there's I think there's a lot of things that make it more MVVM, so to speak, kind of like Knockout or Kendo UI. But I guess you can think of it this way. So the way the diagram is pictured, I mean, you have routes, controllers, views, templates. Um, recently, they've kind of in the new Ember anyway, they're going to depreciate the whole controller aspect, and they're all only going to have con components. Components are, if you're familiar with Angular, they're like directives. So I, I find that more intuitive, by the way, because I think web components are components are web components by definition, right? And directives, what are directives, right? I mean, you could have attribute di um, directives in Angular. You can have all sorts of other things, but that's kind of confusing. You just say components, and people know. So I like that about Ember for sure. But it's MVC, and so that means you've got your, your application structure. So you have your models, your views. Not in, not in the new Ember, really. You just use com controllers anyway. And so, so what makes Ember possible? So there's a couple things that come into it. First, you have the run loop, and that, that's actually ported from Backburner.js. They have the router, the handlebars, soon to be HTML bars, and that's just the templating engine. So when you write your templates in Ember, they, they always have to be, you can use any other template and language you want, you can use Jade, but the default and the most well-supported way to use it is to use handlebars, which is like mustache, they just use, that's what the must, handlebars is, just the mustache is basically, it's, it's really similar to all the other ones. So you've got, uh, it, view layer uses jQuery, so basically if you ever use Backbone, it's really similar because Ember.js basically is Backbone, if you really want to think of it, just appends and removes the views. Views are essentially what they are in Backbone. They're just large portions of the HTML that's being rendered to the page or removed. So that's kind of the way that works. And then you've got your model layer, which is essentially containing all of your data. And that that's really, I would think, well, having used Ember data for some lengthy time, I think that that's pretty much for Ember data. But there's also a number of other uses for model. And then there's build tools. So in the newest Ember.js, um, I was supposed to make a disclaimer earlier. So Ember.js in the past has been its own little framework. You can load it in an HTML page. You can use it like any other framework. But in the future and moving forward from like now on, Ember.js team is adopting a newer model, which is using a tool called Ember CLI. And Ember CLI will soon be called Ember. So this is kind of confusing. But if you have heard, <laughs> no, seriously, I'm not kidding you. That they're doing this. And then. So they're going to have Ember CLI, which is just a large build tool, and it has it uses stuff like Bower, Broccoli, it, it uses ES6, uh, just like Angular 2, by the way. Kind of neat there, doing the same thing. And so that's what I mean when I say Ember. So I have never worked in like, a, just a, well, I have. I've done JS bins and stuff, but definitely prefer working in the Ember CLI. It's a lot more opinionated and strict for what you have to do. So um, let's just look quickly at a sample Ember JS app, because I'm sure you're all wondering what it looks like. So uh, to do that, I'm just going to navigate to the website for um, Ember.js. This is what it looks like. You can see the information here, just at the bottom here. So the most basic one, um, I always start with the template. I think that's the most logical thing to do. When I'm building an app, I always start with the template. So this is what it looks like here. And Ember has some opinions on how things should be rendered. So by default, if you put something in application, uh, it'll always be rendered. That's just like index and application. They're always, they're, they're, they sort of have things to do with each other. You don't have to ever specifically say, oh, I want to load this view in. It's already done for you. So that's why they have this example up front. So you just put name. Oh, sure, no problem. So is that better? Can you guys see? OK, so uh, so you have your text. You, you, val you bind your value, and then you, you can do, that's just using the input helper. That's what the two curly braces mean. It's much. It's very similar to Angular if you ever used that. Um, uh, so anyway, you, you, you basically by doing this, you set up a a binding because you declared it in your in in the two places. And since it since it's just like Angular, actually, it's exactly the same. If you use that, you probably know what this means. And so yeah, you can enter your name, and then it will update in real time. And so this is another example here. You can, I mean, you you, you can already see how this works. You just 
it just concatenates and it, it's basically using the computed properties. So one of the things I really appreciate about Ember, which isn't in other frameworks is, well it is actually, it's in a lot of other ones, but but I really appreciate their syntax, at least right now, for the property syntax. That's changing, so don't get your hopes up. Uh, it's not that much worse, though. So um, uh, the property syntax is pretty cool. You just say what it depends on. So here we're depending on email and size. And whenever one of those changes, and that's saying we have a dependency on those two. Um, as you notice, email and size are declared as part of the object. It just updates up. Uh, automatically. So there's no need to reassign the values of objects when something is done. Like in jQuery, if you've ever had that experience where something updates or, for example, you make a post request and it saves, so you'd have to update the status of saved or something, and then your view, your view layer might change in Backbone, something like that. Uh, you can do bindings in Backbone too, but I'm just giving you an example. So so that's kind of that there. So that's sort of like a basic, uh, basic understanding of how that works. If you want to get into more depth, you can look at the files here, so the controller, uh, the model, they're all. Sorry? Application HBS. Right, so application HBS is here. This is what it looks like. Um, they're just basically assigning it with a component there. So that's what the, that's what they're doing there. They're using the components syntax. In, in the future, you're just going to have components. So get used to the syntax. It's basically, it's essentially what they're going to have in the future is they're going to have the same uh, element syntax as they will, and handlebars will just render, render that for you, or HTML bars in their case. So let's get back to business here. So I'd um, like to get into the eight things I wish I had known when I started learning Ember. So I did say this earlier in the talk, but I'll say it again. I've been working in a startup where we decided to use Ember, uh, mostly for the reason that we had a Java guy or a whole bunch of Java guys doing Java stuff, and I don't know the first thing about whatever Spring or the whole framework thing. I have no idea how that works. So I just wanted to say, I can do my own thing, you do yours, and we'll communicate via REST API. And that's worked really well so far, I think, most of the time anyway. Uh, there was a big learning curve, and that's what I really feel. I wish I had learned, knew more, known more about these, these frameworks when I would started. So first thing I want to talk about is documentation. If you're using Ember, just get this through your head. You do not read much documentation. You just read source code. That's it. There's nothing more to it. You're reading through source code. You have to, if, in order to use Ember, most of the people who use it will read through that source code and they'll understand it pretty damn well. I'm still a little bit rusty myself, but when I learn, when I look up stuff, I don't just go to Stack Overflow. I go to the GitHub page and I look through the source code. That's the Ember mentality right there. So in general, if you have to look it up, if you really think you do, I mean, once you get to a certain point, right? But I, once I got to this point where I am now, if I have to look it up and I don't know it, well, there's probably something I'm doing wrong. So once you learn the basics, there's, there isn't much more, really. I mean, there's some other internal methods and stuff, but you just peruse the source code. So there is no browsing. We just go look at the Ember.js file, and you look at how they implemented it. It's all very well documented in, the, in that. So, so next, I want to talk about sharing. So this is, this, this, is the, uh, this is the second tip I have for you. If you are building an application where you have several dependencies amongst controllers, first of all, you might need to reconsider your architecture. So Ember.js uses this architecture. I know it's quite hard to see. Maybe I can zoom in here. So uh, is it actually zooming in? I don't know if it is. OK, sorry. My bad. So um, in any case, so this is sort of a diagram, which it just has route routes that go to use model four and so forth. And so basically, um, what I was going to say here is when you're building your app and you have want dependencies, use the needs under a controller. And then you can reference it with controller dot controllers dot the controller name, and then you, you have to use quotes, right? That it, it's the way that Ember looks up the, the values. But really, if you're doing that, you really need to consider how, how you're laying out your application. And you can always bind a value using a uh, computed property to like to share a value, essentially, having, a, a, in a sense, a pointer to the same value in another controller. So that's also an option. But I kind of wish I'd known that, because I did things the wrong way when I first started. So that would be uh, the other way is using controller for syntax using this dot controller for and so instead uh, you could you could also put your your values in index uh, index route or you can put them in application controller um, so yeah that that's what I kind of wish I had known because you just put those values in there and then they're kind of global so to speak you don't have to do any other business right it's kind of nice so next I'd like to talk about bubbling up actions so this is really this really confused me when I first started I mean 
because you're building components. You guys all know what components are, right? Raise your hand if you know what a component is, so I don't have to. <laughs> okay, great. So components are self-contained modules that, that, that you can pass in values to, and then they'll, they'll, they'll react a certain way depending on what you pass them in. They're, they're closed off though, right? You can pass in the values, but they can't communicate really with the outside. And that's a really important point if you're building, if you're building components. So, so just just follow these four steps here. If you're going to be bubbling up actions, for example, if you're if you're saying when this element is clicked, bubble up the action and then execute that same action, but on the parent controller. First of all, you should probably rethink this, but if you do, what action? So wire up the action normally under the actions hash, then. Put in the send action in the past action, uh, passed in action, and then third, pass in the action in the controller. So, and then fourth, just code in the hash in your controller. So, I put an example here because I'm sure you're all wondering what that looks like. Um, so, this is what it looks like here. Uh, this is an example of one guy who just I was getting help on the Ember IRC, and he showed me this. So, um, if you do this, it'll it'll do it for you. It'll it'll say this 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 the the same. Um, the same action will be triggered in the parent controller. But really, I don't think this is the best way to do it. So, okay. Next one, authenticated routes. This would have been really useful to know when I started out. Because, of course, any big application, meaning big, having the ability to authenticate oneself, you'll need authentication, right? So, so anyway, to do this, it's actually really simple. I saw a number of tutorials online that were just not what they should have been. So. It's actually really simple. All you do is you wire in the, in the route route for your your parent level route. All you need to do is say uh, before model and then pass in the transition. There should actually be transition in the function there, but you get the idea. So you pass in that transition, and then you can do whatever you want. You can redirect to a different route. You can say you're not authenticated. And so that's what I did here. You can just check out this little gist here. That's what it looks like. Uh, sorry, this is CoffeeScript. That's what we use in my startup, so I was kind of lazy to <laughs> port it to JavaScript. But uh, but if you want to find it, there's a site called JS2 Coffee. You can see what that looks like in JavaScript. Okay, so uh, did I lose something? Did it? Oh, it did. Didn't it? Sorry. Go back here. Okay, so next I want to talk about route versus resource. So this is kind of a confusing part if you're a beginner. You look at an Ember route. It has it uses it does uh, router dot map is the syntax for router. And every Ember app needs a router. So when you route your application, you need to say what what happens when I visit the application slash not application will be like post slash blog slash posts right. And then you'll you'll say what happens in in a pass in function because so you can keep on nesting and nesting, and that's how you define your routes. So, but the funny thing is, before they had resource, you could not pass a function into route. Now you can do that with with route. So they're actually getting rid of resource. So forget about resource. You can actually start using uh, route right now instead of resource. Just take out all the resources in your application, so to speak. <laughs> and so anyway, basically the difference was or has been uh, route pre preserves the scope of your function. So if you go blog and then you route again inside that, the next if you do use a resource inside blog, then it'll keep on. It'll keep the same namespace of blog, and then you add on to that. So instead of having go blog slash this slash that slash that, you just have a nested function, really, like a nested function calls. So that's the difference there. So it resets the scope. So the other thing I kind of mentioned earlier, I wish I had known, just to keep your components dumb. Make sure they're isolated. So ask yourself these three questions. So first of all, are components, they need to be dumb as possible. They need to be read only. And are they encapsulated? By definition, they should be encapsulated. But if they're not, just just make sure they're not. They are because maybe you're doing it wrong, and maybe you need to rethink the way you've approached things. So, have you created more than one route for the given functionality? If so, have you grouped them together using template partials? It's really uh, an interesting thing. You can use partials now. I think they're phasing them out though. In the newer Ember, they're going to phase out partials. So just keep an eye out, but I think partials will most of the time be there because of static content, right? You want to organize your content, you have partials for that. Um, and so just, just think about organizing your content in a way that makes sense. Don't have long files. Try to keep everything sensibly uh, in, encapsulated. So 
Next are shared functionalities and properties created under shared controllers and routes, for example, application controller, and like I said earlier about sharing data between controllers. You can make it a lot easier if you just make it global, sometimes. So, so next I'd like to talk about engaging the community. This one's really important, actually. So a couple things you can do. First of all, you can follow Ember.js on Twitter. You can join the IOC in Ember.js. I wish I had done this more when I started, because I felt really alone. But the Ember.js IRC is a great resource for you. You can click on the link on my presentation. It'll take you to the IRC. You can just come up with the username and start chatting with them. There's usually someone who will respond to your question in like 30 minutes or something, and they give you really good answers, and they even set up a JS bin for you, and they'll show you exactly what you did wrong, which is awesome. Really like that. Um, so next, post on Stack Overflow and Ember Discuss. Ember Discuss is like the version of Stack Overflow, but it's their form they use. They, they use Ember Discuss. They use Discuss or whatever the thing is. And surround yourself, this is really important as well, surround yourself with Ember people, which is hard, but definitely worth it. And, and check out the services like Code Mentor who will actually, you can pay for someone to mentor you, and that's an interesting idea. I didn't find many Ember people on Code Mentor, but there are services like it that'll offer something similar. So next, find yourself an Ember guru, which I kind of mentioned earlier. <laughs> So this is kind of the last thing, one of the last things anyway. Uh, this is working with Ember Data. So do you guys know what Ember Data is? Yeah? No? no? Raise your hand if you know what Ember Data is. OK, so there's two people who know. OK, this is, I have to explain a little bit. So Ember.js is the framework for managing your application, for doing views, for routes, for saying what happens when I click on this button, actions, right? But it doesn't deal with how data is communicated with like a server, like, like a data server, for example, if you're grabbing JSON from a server or using a REST API. There's, the only way to do that if you're using normal Ember is with the jQuery JSON. You can, you can inherit from the JSON in, in jQuery and do that. Problem with the jQuery version is that the deferred implementation or async implementation is not that robust. And there's been a number of criticisms on the jQuery uh, deferred object recently. So definitely have a look at that. But, that's not even close to the reason. So the reason Ember Data is there is it basically it, 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 it interacts directly with your Ember models, and you can actually store everything in your Ember models just by using Ember Disk. You can interact with your servers just with global configurations, and, and then all the requests you make there on can use like different tokens, or you can, you can use these different adapters. So that's really the main usage of it. You can also use really cool stuff like the local storage adapter and store all your data locally, kind of like what Hoodie does. It stores all your data offline first or it does an offline first op implementation. You can fall back and do all sorts of really cool things with serializing your data from a server. There's really cool possibilities with Ember data. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone, does it? Yeah? OK. So Ember data is tricky. Um, it is really, really tricky when you start out. There's a lot of stuff that you have to understand. For example, customizing headers and understanding how that how the how the serialization actually occurs in general. In general, this is the case. So you're going to have to modify. You're going to have to look at source code, and you're going to have to modify your API. Usually, Ember is very specific. I mean, at least for the re the most recent Ember data, they're changing it to be more flexible. But Ember data is think of it kind of like an addition to Ember. It's not really Ember, but it's an addition. So you're going to have to change the way that you do your REST API if you are doing one, most likely. For example, we had um, we had objects in our REST API that were the defaults. For example, in the Jersey framework and Java, will just they won't uh, they won't have named objects. They'll just give you the objects anonymously. When I say named, I mean there's just an array, a, na a name corresponding to array. This is JSON format. But if you want to add names, you'll have to modify that, and that's not something you get right out of the box. Ember has been known to work really well with Rails. So if you're a Rails person, then you can use the active model adapter, and then you're good. But I'm not a Rails person, so I had to struggle with this, unfortunately. And then you have to be prepared to write serializers. Pretty much any time you're going to need to write a serializer to just say what happens, how the data is extracted, and what happens in your model layer. So next, embedded records. Uh, this, was so, this took me so long to figure out. I kind of wish I had known this earlier. but. Embedded records, which is basically when you have nested IDs or references to the IDs of the records, they're actually native. So you don't have to do anything except for async, really. You have to say async, but that's, that's, that's coming out of Ember shortly, Ember data. So you won't even have to say async. It'll just work. So kind of wish I'd known that. In general, Ember data works, but just use it at your own risk. And there is a learning curve, so be prepared to learn. So 
this is the last thing I have to show you. So these are just a number of useful Ember links here. So uh, you can view all my stars on GitHub. I have a lot of cool Ember libraries that I start, and you can just see them when I, as I update them. It's just searching for Ember. You can see you can sign up for the Ember Weekly newsletter. That's an awesome resource. Same thing as N NG newsletter or whatever. NG Weekly, same thing as Angular. It's always a newsletter for a framework. And you can view all these other tu tutorials and slides recently. Oh yeah, right. Um, so the question was, are there any tools that I that I can recommend for debugging Ember? Um, that's funny you mentioned that because if I go back to this last slide here, there's actually one on managing your errors, I believe. Yes, ma managing Ember errors. So this is a decent presentation someone else did, and it kind of goes into the um, into the ways that you can do it. So the cool thing about Ember, sorry, I'm zoom in here. Um, is that you can, there's an error that's, uh, an error method that's always triggered, and you can wire up to that and say what happens. So, um, I don't know why it's doing that, but yeah, you get the idea. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot you can do with the Ember errors, and you can definitely customize the way that happens. One thing I should note is that in the Ember CLI, at least, you have an Ember template for error that's always displayed when something goes wrong. For example, you try to fetch data from the server, you get a not found. Ember error template displays. It's just called error.hps, and it's local, and it's just in the root directory. And you can create one. If it's not there, it won't render one, but you can create it. Same with loading. There's a loading page that, you, that always displays when it's getting data with Ember data. So that's kind of the neat things. Ember will have these specified constructs that are always there without you knowing about it, but you can always override them. Same with feet serialization and so forth, you can always override their methods and extend their functionality. But remember to call super, right? You have to call super or else yeah. it won't. Yeah, and there's an inspector plugin, so that's a really useful tool as well. Um, not necessarily, well, maybe for debugging errors. Um, the thing about the Ember CLI framework is that, it, like I said, it uses ES6 uh, transpiler, so um, if you're writing, also if you're writing in CoffeeScript, it doesn't do uh, map at all, so I hope they can fix that soon. Uh, so a source a source map, but anyway, there are those are great tools. Yeah, I like the Ember. I definitely use the Ember inspector on Chrome and Firefox. It's available for both of those. Um, and so, where was I? Oh, was this? I don't. Oh, this is it here. So yeah, and that, those are the useful tools. Um, are there any other questions? So it's not so much of a question, but a comment. Like one of the things that you had mentioned in there is making sure that you're writing serializers for your model. Mm -hmm. I've always found that almost every app that I've worked on you end up doing that same thing anyway, because especially as you start to support potentially different clients, like different mobile devices and and web app, or you start to you've got different API versions, or you've got um, you know even even frankly a lot of times I find there's a conflict with uh, even with language convention, so with Rails, for example, everything's underscored, right? And on, if you're trying to stick with convention on the JavaScript side, it's camel case. So sometimes, well, a lot of the time, I find in my model layer, I've got serializers as well. So I think that's you have to not, be prepared to write that. Yeah, not something necessarily. Maybe it's a little bit more specific to Ember, but I think it's actually probably a pretty good pra practice if you set yourself up to be able to support that. You. Can get a lot of gains out of it in terms of maintainability. It really depends on what your implementation of the API is. I think that's true. You can, if you use the Active Model Adapter, it'll automatically do the it'll do the underscored syntax for you, right? That's the default. Actually, they're changing on a new version of it, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a nice thing that comes out of Ember. I mean, as far as I know, no other framework does that. I know that the guys that came, that created Ember, Tom and uh, Ubuntu, I mean, they're some of the core. Used to be, I don't know if it's still but core contributed to Rails as well. So yeah, it's definitely it's Railsy. It's Railsy. That's why a lot of people use CoffeeScript. There's even a script now, a scripting language called Ember Script. Don't recommend it, but if you like CoffeeScript, check it out. It's Ember Script. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah. Um, have, you ever, have you ever had any problems with 
I mean, I, I haven't worked in that large of an Ember app like yet. I mean, obviously, the app that I'm working on is going to grow. And the uh, she's, sorry, the question was, have I worked with any? Have I had encountered any page load load issues? Uh, with the Ember Inspector, you can see the speed at which your page is loading. You can see how much each page, how long each page takes to load. The other thing is, there's there's an interesting concept where the more views you have, the longer it'll take to render. And this is where components kind of come to bite you in the back, so to speak. Because if you have like, if you're breaking up everything into ridiculously small components, or if you have a bunch of components on the page, it'll take a long time to render. I know Vine had this issue, so definitely look at the Vine uh, Vine posts, and they, they have one about Ember performance, where they talk about how Ember performance can be greatly affected by having a number of elements on the screen. They were trying to load videos, and so they ended up implementing their own solution of, so to speak, lazy loading. If you look at my uh, GitHub stars, there's actually a library on there. I don't remember what it's called, but it'll do that for you. It'll load your views lazily. In the next version of Ember, they're going to do this by default. So in the version two, right, 2.0, that'll be sort of the, uh, or they're, they're looking to do that. That's one of the features they're trying to bring in, the Ember, according to the Ember core team. Are there any other questions? That's it. OK, well, once again, thank you for your time. You can view this talk online. And also, uh, I have business cards. So if you want to get back in touch with me, you can get a business card. OK, thank you. All right, I'm not going to displace people, but thanks. Uh, thank you to both our speakers today and to all the sponsors that are helping out. Have been you, Petra P, Assembly. Um, give them a round of applause. And thanks, you guys, for all, all for coming out. Um, I guess next month is again TV, so we're kind of trying to figure out whether we want to do talks or whether we want to just do kind of the social because it's getting a little bit closer to Christmas time. Um, you know, I, I'm leaning towards I think probably social, but uh, in the meantime, if you guys have a talk topic that you want to give or even you want to hear about. Let any one of us know. You can post it on the Meetup page. You can, you can tweet at us. You can just I mean, try and we're all pretty accessible on online. If you just Google one of us, you can probably find more information than I'm comfortable with. And uh, <laughs> you, you'll be able to find us and just get in touch with us and let us know. Um, we're looking for, I don't know, we're, we're looking for anything. I think uh, in February, we're hoping that we're going to have kind of uh, uh, one of the ladies is going to give a presentation on um, her experience learning JavaScript from knowing nothing to six months in, how she's been doing and the stuff that, have, that has helped her and what she's built. Um, I think I'll probably at some point give a talk about React and some of the stuff we're doing at Kissmetrics around uh, you know, how React's working for us, some of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, but yeah, open to open to talks and, and or demos, so hit us up. Thank you.